Good evening. Just waiting for some people to hopefully join us for our evening reflection on scripture. Got a couple minutes still. Hi to those who've just joined. Hi, Muriel. Hi, Ann. Good to see you both. Very good. Well, it's 7.30, so we'll go ahead and get started. We'll start with a reading from Scripture. Good evening to those who just joined. We're starting, uh, we are continuing, excuse me, a study on the beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which is known to us as the Beatitudes, these first uh, 12 verses of Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> so we'll read through this each week and we'll reflect on each Beatitude in turn. So reading from the Bible, Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called sons and daughters of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. So as, as we discussed last week, when we talk about these Beatitudes, we heard last week that the term word Beatitude refers to <clears throat> excuse me, a state of supreme blessedness, right? As good as it gets, right? And along with the Ten Commandments from the Hebrew Bible, what we sometimes call the Old Testament, we can say that these Beatitudes, along with the Ten Commandments, are some of the most transformative, some of the most impactful and important words in the entire Bible. And I think that's because when they are heard and when they are lived out, that God uses these Beatitudes to create a new way of living in us. Last week, we uh, heard that these Beatitudes should not be idealized as only for the so-called spiritual elite, nor should they be legalized as a checklist by which we can earn God's favor. Instead, when we hear or read or ponder the Beatitudes, we encounter a vision of what Daryl Johnson, who's a biblical scholar and a pastor, he likes to call gospelized humanity. And gospelized humanity are those whose lives are changed by the good news of Jesus Christ. The qualities in the Beatitudes, meekness, poverty of spirit, purity of heart, they become evident in our lives when God claims us as his sons and daughters, when the Holy Spirit lives in us, when Christ becomes the great treasure of our lives. So that's when these take root. It's not our actions that do it. It's God's actions, God's Spirit living and working within us. So we've heard and, we, and we've seen as we look through the text as well how each of these Beatitudes begins with the same word that we often translate as blessed. And the Greek word is makarios. 
It can also be translated a little more loosely as happy or even congratulations. Each of these hints at, um, at the meaning, but to put it even more loosely, we better understand the force of this word makarios if we translate it as you lucky vagabond, you have won the spiritual lottery <laughs> of sorts. In other words, you have won everything. You have nothing to offer, and yet you won the grand prize, and God cannot wait to welcome you inside. Makarios, this blessedness, this happiness that Jesus talks about is not how we feel about ourselves, and it's certainly not how we might feel about God. Both how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about God, those things can change from moment to moment. Ups and downs, peaks and troughs, and whatnot. Now, Makarios in, this, in his Beatitudes is about how God feels about us. And how God approaches us never changes. God loves us more than we can ever possibly hope to begin to understand. And the good news is that this love of God we are told in Scripture, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so, to this opening beatitude then, which is often translated as, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We'll do it a little bit more loosely, try and get the force of this. Blessed are the vagabonds, those lucky bums who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the Bible uses different words for poor. On the one hand, it refers to a kind of poverty that we today might call a working poverty, in which is a state of absolutely having no property, having to work all the time, no days off at all, getting by with the absolute bare essentials, no smartphone, no holidays, a kind of life with absolutely no extra bells and whistles, none whatsoever. On the other hand, the Bible also talks about a kind of poverty that we might call destitution. And this kind of poverty involves having no other choice than to having to openly beg for help from others. In this kind of poverty, one has absolutely nothing, and there is absolutely no illusion about it. It is basically like begging on the streets. And so in this first beatitude, we talked about the poor in spirit. These two kinds of poverty, which one is Jesus talking about? And I think we can infer from the text that he's talking about the second kind of poverty. Poverty as destitution. So let's translate it again. Blessed are the destitute in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who come to God with absolutely empty hands. For those people, to those people, belongs the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jesus is saying. And he wasn't just talking about the economically poor, though we know that the Lord has a lot to say on the subject of economic poverty, as does the whole of Scripture for that matter. But in this passage, it's clear that Jesus is talking about the poor in spirit. But what does it mean to be poor in spirit? I think it means, partially at least, one of the things it means is that no matter how much one has or doesn't have, it is knowing that one is always, always, always at the absolute mercy of God. It's knowing that every year, every month, every day, hour, minute, and second, and millisecond is a gift to us from Almighty God. This kind of poverty in spirit is what one German theologian named Friedrich Schleiermacher, that's a great name, Schleiermacher talked in his, in his writings about this feeling of absolute dependence on God. Absolute dependence for every little thing. And I think that's the kind of poverty in, in spirit that Jesus is talking about here. I once heard it said that the poor in spirit are those who know the need for God that we all have. I'll say that again. The poor in spirit are simply those who know keenly this unending need for God that every human being really does have. Right. We all have this need whether we recognize it or not. And to paraphrase one of my favorite Christian writers, St. Augustine, 
that he, he, one of his fa most famous lines was, Our hearts are restless, O God, until they find their rest in you. So someone who is poor in spirit knows their inexhaustible need for God. So, but I have to admit that human beings being what we are, we are often very stiff-necked, very prideful, and not many of us enjoy the idea of having this overwhelming sense of desperate need for God. We like to build up our own bubbles and our own false stories that we are in control of our destinies, that we're in charge of our own lives. And sometimes it's not until everything we have is stripped away that we come to the realization of how much we truly need God in our lives. And I do believe that sometimes the arts, like uh, in all their forms, do a wonderful job of making points. And one of my favorite form of the arts is movies. And one of my favorite movies is It's a Wonderful Life. It's an eternal classic, as far as I'm concerned, starring uh, the great Jimmy Stewart and the great Donna Reed. It's a Christmas classic, but it's good, I think, any time of year to watch it. And for those who know this movie, It's a Wonderful Life, if you've never seen it, after we're done tonight, please go watch it immediately. But we know the end, near the end of the movie, George Bailey, who's played by Jimmy Stewart, is watching all of his hard work, all of his dreams crumble around him. Earlier in the movie, he is a good-natured, but he believes himself to be a completely self-sufficient man. And all of that begins to change when he realizes how helpless he really is. In that famous scene on the bridge in the movie, and he's, everything is stripped away, and then with tears in his eyes, he says, Lord, I'm not a praying man but I need help. And it was in that moment in the movie, through Clarence the Angel, of course, that God broke in to George Bailey's life and changed him forever. It was in that moment, I think, that Bailey's character reminded us all of the poverty of spirit that we all have, whether we recognize it or not. It's a reminder to us that our wealth, the the uh, the incalculable conveniences of our culture, while not bad in themselves, they can create an illusion of self-sufficiency. And sometimes, like George Bailey, many of us need to be near the end of our rope before we truly begin to understand our true poverty of spirit, before we begin to understand and accept our inescapable need for God. But Jesus says of such people who finally recognize their need for God, that theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And this is because this poverty of spirit, this destitution of spirit, friends, it's the necessary condition for all real spiritual growth. Real spiritual growth, becoming these gospelized people, these, this beatitude humanity does not begin with our strength, does not begin with our talents, our abilities, or our resources. It starts with the realization that we need help. That we are poor in spirit and we are in constant need of God's presence in our lives. And I think the Apostle Paul understood this poverty of spirit because he has this rather astounding line in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He, he says to his, uh, to his uh, friends in Corinth, he says, When I am weak, then I am strong. He could have easily said, When I am poor in spirit, then I am strong. Now, I know for a fact that many of us are our own harshest critics. It's easy to put ourselves down. It's easy to think of ourselves as people who are less than worthy, who don't measure up, who are inadequate, whose struggles seem to get the better of us more often than not. I think we all think and feel this way about ourselves from time to time. And if this resonates with you, when you feel such things, rather than give in to despair, I would encourage us to... to Embrace that feeling of poverty of spirit. But don't stop there. Embrace the feeling and then think back to these opening words of Jesus and say, I might be destitute, I might be poor in spirit, but Jesus says then, the kingdom is for me. The kingdom is for me. Right? Let that sink in. The character of the kingdom, God's kingdom, is revealed in those and for those and to those who know that they are spiritually inadequate and are in need of God's help. I think that is good news. 
And I think that is wonderfully freeing. Knowing that even in our brokenness, even in our confusion, in our need for help, that is when God is at work in our lives. That is when God is telling us through Jesus Christ that the kingdom of heaven belongs to us. So if we struggle with doubt, the kingdom of heaven is ours. If we struggle with pain, the kingdom of heaven is ours. If we struggle with worry or stress, the kingdom of heaven is ours. If we struggle with any kind of addiction, if we know our own emptiness, our own inability to break free, ours is the kingdom of heaven. Every single human being, in reality, is spiritually poor. But Jesus said, blessed are those whose hands are empty. Blessed are those who are inadequate. Blessed are we when we admit our spiritual bankruptcy and need God to fill us with his spirit again and again. For it is when we admit that we have nothing, that's when we receive the kingdom again. That's when new life with God can begin or begin again. So thanks be to God for this poverty of spirit. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such people. Amen. Friends, as always, if you are in need of any help or support, or you know of anyone in our community in Kimne who is in need of support, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can message us uh, through the church Facebook page, or uh, you can make contact with me here at the Mance. Our contact information is listed on our webpage at kimneparish.church. But please do reach out if you're in need of help or support. We'll be pleased to do everything we can. But I look forward to being back here with you next week to join in, our, in the study of our next Beatitude from the Sermon on the Mount. So until then, look after yourselves, look after each other. God bless you all. Thanks for watching.